Okay, bonjour tout le monde. Je suis heureux de vous présenter M. Francis Zwiers, directeur du Pacific Climate Impact Consortium à l'Université de Victoria. Il a complété sa formation en tant que mathématicien et statisticien à Dalhousie University en les années 60 à 90, 80, je m'excuse. Au cours des années suivantes, il a notamment été chef du Centre canadien de modélisation et d'analyse du climat et directeur de la division de la recherche sur le climat à, à Environnement Canada. En tant que chercheur scientifique, son expertise consiste à appliquer des méthodes statistiques à l'analyse de la variabilité et du changement observé et simulé du climat. Le Dr. Zwiers est membre de la Société royale du Canada et de la Société météorologique américaine. Il est aussi récipiendaire de la médaille Patterson et du prix du président. Il a agi comme coordonnateur principal des auteurs du quatrième rapport d'évaluation de la IPCC et a été élu membre du bureau de l'IPCC pour le cinquième rapport d'évaluation. Aujourd'hui, il nous parlera au sujet de « Event Attribution, the Emerging Science of Attributing Causes to Extreme Events ». Le nous offre une bien chaleureuse bienvenue à Québec. Merci beaucoup, Steve. Je vais faire ma présentation en anglais afin de sauver vos oreilles, de vous sauver d'un épreuve très difficile. Um, I'm the, I'll, I'll try to tell you a little bit of science, but I'll also uh, entertain you a little bit by showing you a, a few photos as I go along. And the, I'm the fellow who's behind the lens on almost all of these, these photos and the, the ideas simply to, to give you a, a little bit of an impression of something personal that sometimes helps to uh, improve the communication with the audience. Um, I'll give you uh, an introduction to uh, event attribution and, and an overview of what this is all about. Uh, this is evolving into a, a fairly important aspect of climate science. Uh, there was recently uh, a report uh, that was produced by the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. specifically focused on event attribution. It was released in March of 2016, and that was the most uh, second most downloaded report from the National Academy of Sciences website in 2016, uh, something in excess of 10,000 downloads in, in a short period of time. So, so there are a lot of people who are, are curious about this. Um, I've been working with a postdoc on, on conducting an event attribution study that's motivated by the Fort McMurray fire, and so I'll be talking about that. And then, uh, if time is permits, I'll also give you a brief glimpse at some results concerning other recent events. Um, and, and that'll be the, the talk. Uh, this is a photo that I didn't take. I wasn't in Fort McMurray at the, at the time. It's a, a very frequently used media photo that shows uh, the exodus from, from Fort McMurray. Uh, so the context for this talk and for most talks about event attribution is the very ex extensive reporting that takes place in the media now on extreme events. Uh, every time there's a big event like this, uh, there are pages and pages, uh, hundreds of websites pop up. Uh, uh, there is almost immediately a connection made with uh, human-induced climate change, even if there isn't science to support that. Uh, and, that's, and so as a consequence of public perception, because of the intense media attention, the public perception is that the frequency and intensity of extremes is, is increasing. You, hear, you hear often hear scientists say this as well as, as hearing the public say this. Uh, there's a growing, certainly a growing economic impact of extreme events. If we think of the Calgary floods, uh, 100,000 people were displaced, there were five deaths, uh, about $1.7 billion in insured losses, uh, something like $5.7 billion in total losses. Uh, the Fort McMurray fire, uh, 88,000 people displaced, two deaths, uh, not directly caused by the fire itself, but uh, that occurred in a traffic accident during, during the ac exodus. Uh, $3.6 billion in insured losses and estimated total losses to uh, economic losses of the order of $10 billion was recently published figure. 
Uh, so the insurance industry is very worried about this. They see costs rising very rapidly. Uh, whether that's because uh, vulnerability is increasing, uh, whether we're because we're putting more stuff in harm's way, or if it's because uh, the frequency of events is, is increasing is, is not so clear. But there's certainly a lot of worry. Uh, these numbers, uh, two, five deaths in the case of the Calgary floods, two deaths in the case of the Fort McMurray fires, uh, tells you something about how well our society is adapted to, uh, to extremes. We do a pretty good job of, of managing the response to extremes. If you uh, consider that uh, these are relatively small numbers of fatalities compared, compared to the number of fatalities that would occur in, uh, during a similar kind of event in the, in the developing world. Uh, so it certainly seems chaotic during the occurrence of such an event, but somehow we managed to get people out of harm's way. Uh, so I said the media discourse tends to evoke possible links to climate change almost immediately. And as a default, as scientists, we, we kind of aid and abet that process. So uh, we'll point at the event that we won't know anything about what caused the event that has just occurred, but, but we'll use the opportunity Someone will stick a microphone in your face and say, uh, you know, Mr. Scientist or Miss Scientist, what do you think? Uh, and, and you'll be honest and you'll say, well, I really don't know, but uh, this is like the kind of thing that's going to happen in the future more frequently. Okay, that's probably true, but it, uh, what you're doing when you respond in that particular way is that you give the, the journalist license to make an attribution that you're not willing uh, or brave enough to make yourself. But uh, you know, if, you're, if you're dumb enough to do this, go and run with it. It's kind of the message that you're, you're giving the journalist. Uh, so event attribution science has been trying to find a way for science to do better than this. And so that requires really rapid response science. And there are some approaches that are now being used where uh, we can give uh, an informed opinion on, on an event within a week or two. So if you think of the floods that occurred within in, in Louisiana uh, as a consequence of very heavy precipitation. Uh, there was a complete paper on this event that was posted uh, on one of the European discussion journals. That paper still under review. The, the, the review process is very slow, but the paper was submitted within two weeks of the event. And the, and the scientists were uh, relatively large team of scientists uh, from the Netherlands and the UK, primarily some Americans. Uh, we're able to provide an opinion pretty quickly. Uh, it really places high demands on process understanding, on data models, statistical methods, and so on. And as I pointed out, it's, it was recently assessed, event attribution was recently assessed by uh, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. So a question that the public asks is, did human influence on the climate system cause the event? That's usually how the, how the the question is posed, and, and that's not really a, a scientifically tractable question, and so what most studies do is ask, did uh, human-induced climate change affect the odds of the event occurring, or alter its magnitude in some way or other? And so uh, those are kind of risk-based questions. They both involve a calculation of probability distributions, and then you ask how that probability distribution is different today than uh, what that probability distribution might have looked like uh, in a climate, uh, a pre-industrial climate, or in the climate that we would have experienced today in the absence of human influence on the climate system. So there's a, a, an active discussion in the climate community about event attribution, and there are some people who think that we should reframe the, the question entirely. So did human influence, if we, we pose the question in that way, did human influence, uh, these people argue that that immediately requires comparison with a counterfactual world, the, the world that might have been had we not dumped all the greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. And, and so they argue, well, this places the, uh, the, the uh, burden of proof on the scientists to demonstrate each time an event has occurred that the climate has changed in a demonstrable way. So they argue instead, well, we know that there's more greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, and therefore that the 
the entire system is uh, operating in some sense differently because uh, the radiative balance of the planet today is different than the radiative balance of the planet in, in 1850. And so they suggest that instead we should ask questions such as how much, for example, of a given storm's precipitation is due to the attributed warming. So accepting uh, that there has been a certain amount of warming. And that leads to a different approach to analysis uh, that uh, in a recent paper was dubbed the, the storyline approach because it requires you uh, basically to describe the synoptic situation in which the storm occurred. There's a certain circulation. Uh, that circulation transports moisture from one place to another. And so we have to then have to estimate how much of that transported moisture, uh, how much additional moisture was there because the uh, temperatures in the source region were higher than uh, now than, than they might have been. So you still have to use that word might have been. And so despite the strong arguments, the distinction is maybe not quite as clear as, as we'd like. Uh, what the distinction really amounts to is a discussion about the extent to which physical reasoning comes to bear. So if you think about what happens in medical science, in medical science we have people who who study disease from a population perspective, these are epidemiologists. And so they're able to tell you what the probability of contracting cancer, for example, would be how it is elevated as a consequence of, of smoking, for example. So that's, so that's a, a, essentially an actuarial problem and it requires lots of statistics. Uh, but in medical science, there are also people who, who study disease within individuals, pathologists. And so, you know, if a person dies, you might say, well, this person was more likely to die because they were in this particular risk group. Or you might actually open up the person, the coroner would do that, and examine exactly what caused the particular death that occurred. And, and both branches of medicine are extremely useful and they coincide together very well in, in, in meteorology and climatology. We still kind of have this tension between those who take a more statistical approach and those who uh, take a, a purely process-based approach. And it, it comes down to communication between the, the two groups. So most studies uh, compare the factual with the counterfactual climate as opposed to taking this story line-based approach. And the counterfactual world is the one that might have been if we hadn't emitted the 600 or so gigatons of carbon that we have emitted into the atmosphere since pre-industrial. And these studies almost always define a class of events as opposed to the specific event that happened. So we don't study the Fort McMurray fire per se. We study a, a, the possibility of circumstances that are as extreme or more extreme and the circumstances that accompanied the Fort McMurray fire. And so we're, we're just studying an entire class of events, and, and that allows us to use a probabilistic approach. So Ted Shepard, who's a Canadian who's now at the uh, University of Reading, uh, defines this as a risk-based approach, and he contrasts it with the, with the storyline approach, which requires the analysis of the specific event that occurred. So in this risk-based approach, um, if you look at this National Academy of Sciences report, you'll see a big section on framing. And what this means is, is the entire series of decisions that are made in, in, in scoping an event attribution study. And so the kinds of decisions that, that have to be made, you have to decide whether you're going to take this class-based approach or, or focus on the individual event. Uh, you have to decide on an analysis approach. Is it risk-based or storyline? Uh, these, are, these are two ways of dividing up the universe, and they don't quite do it in, in parallel. Uh, so uh, consider there are some risk-based approaches available now that can be applied to, to individual events. Uh, but generally, uh, the lineup is between the individual events and the storyline approach or a class-based uh, description of an event and a, and a risk-based approach. Then you have to think a lot about what the event is that you're actually going to study. And I'll, I'll be talking about that more in, in a minute. Uh, you have to think about which event-based, risk-based question you're going to, to ask. Uh, 
So if you ask a question about the odds of the event that you're studying, or about the magnitude, or both. And then you have to worry about what factors that need to be taken into account when you're calculating those odds. So that's what statisticians call conditioning, probability conditional upon um, this having happened or some other thing having happened, or not conditioning at all, uh, using the marginal probability distributions. So the kinds of things that people condition on are the prevailing pattern of sea surface temperature anomalies, for example. So what state was the surface of the ocean in? That affects the, the global circulation status, the different circulation status during a, an El Nino event than we have during a La Nina event. Certainly in the West Coast, we're very aware of that, uh, the strong El Nino res response to circulation on the West Coast. Uh, and and um, so quite a few studies take, take that particular approach. So framing is all about how the question is asked and, and it affects the answer that you get and the user needs to be aware of that. So um, first on how the event is defined, and this is kind of the canonical event attribution event that, that, uh, that has been discussed extensively and that uh, that kind of started off this science. Uh, there was a paper in 2003 by Miles Allen, University of, of Oxford, very short uh, commentary in nature, uh, basically asking, proposing that we would be able to, to study events in this particular way by calculating a number called the fraction of attributable risk. So what the fraction of the current probability that is attributable to human influence on the climate system. The context for, for his article was whether or not the evidence that was available would be strong enough to support uh, a legal argument in court if you were taking an oil company or somebody like that to, to, uh, to court. Uh, well, that provided that thought provided the basis for the first event attribution study that was actually carried out at the UK Met Office by, by Peter Stott. Uh, and it studied the European 2003 heat wave. Uh, and, and that's uh, an event that I'm sure many people will have been aware of. There are, um, depending upon which paper you read, 35, somewhere between 35 and 65,000 deaths that were attributable in France due to, due to this particular event. It's pretty hard to define this event. And that's the point of, of this map. So this shows uh, the mean temperature between the 20th of July and the 20th of August 2003 against uh, the mean temperature during the same month in uh, the five years that were centered on 2003. Um, so that's the difference. And, and so certainly you see that France is very warm. Some other places were warm. Exact boundaries as to where temperatures were ex exceptionally warm, difficult to define. Uh, many different definitions for heat waves. And, and uh, climate models at the time maybe were not quite so capable of, of simulating heat waves, or, or at least they hadn't been as well studied. And so the, the, the choice that was, that was made was not to study uh, the particular heat wave that occurred, but rather to, to study uh, the very warm summer during which that heat wave occurred. Okay, so 2003 was a very warm year in Europe. Uh, these are the temperature anomalies that, uh, on a five degree grid that were observed in, in Europe. So uh, there were some places that were more than four degrees above normal uh, for, the, for the entire summer, uh, which is an event that was way beyond the natural variability of, of summer temperature. So it's summer mean temperature over a region like this is something that climate models are better able to simulate. So the event attribution study was actually posed in terms of summer mean temperature. This is the uh, summer mean temperature for this region right there in 2003. And it's set against uh, a background of observations and simulations from climate models. And you see that it's far above the variability that's simulated by either the observations or the climate models. And you can't distinguish the trace that uh, represents the observations from the trace that, that represents the climate models and traces that represent the climate models. And so it's telling you something about the climate models 
the ability of climate models to simulate the variability in seasonal mean temperature in this particular part of the world, and they do a pretty decent job. And then these are projections for the future, and the projection for the future indicates that this event is going to become a common event in, in the future in this, in this region. And so France has subsequently uh, experienced some further heat wave. And they, at the assessment at the time was that, uh, best estimate was that human-induced climate change had made that event about four times more likely than it would have been in, in an undisturbed climate. So, uh, so you have to make these choices as to how you, you study the event or exactly what event that you study. And then you also have to make a choice as to which climate risk-based question that you study. So, so this is an example of another event, again, in Europe. This is a, uh, a heat wave that affected uh, Western Russia, Moscow, uh, in particular, was in the news in 2010, you might recall, uh, news coverage of the, the heat wave in Moscow. Uh, very uh, dirty air uh, polluted by emissions from wildfires in, in, in the area. Uh, very poor air quality. Uh, this is roughly what the uh, surface temperature anomaly map looked like in, in, 2000, in July 2010, so centered on Western Russia and, and Eastern Europe with, again, with uh, extreme temperatures above five degrees or so above what would have been considered to be normal for, for that area. Um, the way in which this was studied uh, was a couple of different ways. So there was a group in the United States that looked at this from a, uh, a storyline uh, perspective, uh, studying how what the circulation looked like and, and what the magnitude of that event looked like. Uh, and, and their conclusion was, well, there's, you know, humans didn't make a very big change. Uh, and so their, their headline was, well, this is essentially a natural event. A uh, group in Oxford studied this and they used a more actuarial approach and they used uh, uh, climate models that were running on a system called climateprediction.net, which is a, a very interesting way of crowdsourcing resources for climate modeling. Well, basically, they set up a, a climate model, uh, atmosphere-only climate model. They specified the observed sea surface temperature distribution in July of 2010 and a, an estimate of what the pre-industrial sea surface temperature distribution might have been with the same patterns of anomalies. And then uh, as, a, as an individual, you can sign up at climateprediction.net and, and uh, volunteer the use of your PC and they'll download the climate model uh, and, the, and the driving data for the, for the experiment onto your, onto your PC. Uh, It'll run uh, for a couple of months using background cycles that are available on your PC, and when the experiment is completed, then it, uh, it uh, transfers some output from the model back to the climate prediction dot or uh, server in, in Oxford. And so they can get tens of thousands of simulations in, in that particular way for particular kinds of experiments. And so these distributions, uh, what you're seeing here is the survivor function, uh, come from those kinds of experiments under uh, factual conditions and counterfactual conditions. And so what you see is a small change in magnitude. Uh, this is the event that occurred, uh, the magnitude of the event that occurred, and uh, a large change, relatively large change in frequency. And so here you would conclude that human influence on the climate system uh, has augmented the the magnitude somewhat and has substantially augmented the frequency of, of the event that, that is being studied. And so the, the message here is depending upon whether you're focused on the magnitude or the frequency, you might draw somewhat different conclusions. And so it's the best thing to do is to consider both in, in all studies. Um, okay, and then this question about what do you condition upon? And you can condition upon uh, just the, the forcing, so you could ask what is the distribution of something that you're interested in given the forcing that the climate system has experienced, which is due to human-induced changes of the, of the atmosphere and the land surface, changes in greenhouse gas composition, more aerosols, uh, changes in land use that alter the, 
the uh, albedo of the land surface, and so on, alter the surface energy budget. Um, and plus, there are also natural external changes to, to the forcing of the climate system. So think of volcanic activity. Every time there's a, a, a volcanic eruption, uh, a large one, uh, there's a lot of material that's ejected into the stratosphere, which uh, prevents solar radiation from reaching the surface. And so you end up with a period that's a little bit cooler. And that rains, that material rains out after a couple of years. So the typical response to a volcanic event is quite clearly seen in, in global mean temperature. You see a rapid decline just after the occurrence of the event of about half a degree C global or so. And then over two or three years, a, a recovery of global mean temperature. So if you have periods with uh, frequent volcanic activity, then that might be a cooler period than a period that uh, doesn't have very much volcanic activity. So an undisturbed world wouldn't have the, the uh, anthropogenic contribution. So then that's a counterfactual world. Uh, and so then you might ask, well, what is the distribution of temperature or whatever uh, in this disturbed world comparing it with the distribution in the undisturbed world. And so that's a, a problem that we can attempt to answer using climate models primarily. Um, but we also might want to constrain the estimate of the probability distribution by saying, well, we know that there was some pattern of sea surface temperature anomalies that set up the circulation in a particular way. So given that we had this particular configuration of the ocean, what if, how does this distribution look different today than it might have looked given the same configuration of the oceans. And it, this is uh, a useful way of proceeding because it allows you to do the climate modeling that's required much more economically. You now don't need a couple ocean to take ocean variability into account, which you have to take into account here. This involves coupled models. This involves uncoupled models. So this is much cheaper to do. Uh, but uh, it becomes tougher to uh, say things about frequency and to communicate things about frequency. Because I can now say, well, this is 10 times more likely if the ocean is in this particular configuration. But I don't have any information about whether or not the ocean is now in this configuration more frequently or less frequently than in the past. So from, if I were an insurance company executive, this wouldn't be particularly helpful for me for setting premiums for the next decade, for example. Um, so many studies condition on SS sea surface temperature anomalies, and that means that they're restricting a source of variability, and that might improve signal-to-noise ratios and so on. Uh, so I've, I've talked about all of this, and I've also mentioned uh, that there are lots of uncertainties that, that this imposes that are they're kind of hidden. And so one is this, this notion of change in frequency of a particular sea surface temperature setup that we don't know anything about. But we also have to estimate the counterfactual world-based state, uh, which we didn't observe. So we have to use climate models to, a couple of climate models to do that uh, before asking the event attribution question. And that also induces some, some uncertainty. When you do all of this, there are a couple of key numbers that come out. And so the one that I've already mentioned is this fraction of attributable risk that was uh, introduced to the climate science community by uh, Miles Allen in 2003. But it's, but it's an idea that's used extensively in, in other areas of science. Uh, and basically, uh, what it is is uh, calculates, you, requires you to calculate what the current probability of the event was what the probability of the event was under some uh, prior condition. Uh, so there presumably is an increase in the probability of the event, and you divide by the current probability of the event. So uh, if you know what the cause of this increase in probability is, then we know what the fractional uh, amount of today's probability of occurrence is that you can attribute to, to that cause. Uh, and so that would be greenhouse gas emissions and anthropogenic use of the land surface. Um, so under suitable conditions, this, this, you can demonstrate that this can be interpreted as the probability of necessary causation. Uh, so that uh, asks the question about whether or not the condition uh, that changed this probability was necessary for the event to occur. Uh, 
the most extreme events that we are studying today uh, still have um, probabilities of necessary causation that, that are not unity, but we have a few that are, that are getting close or perhaps are there. Um, uh, there was a, there's a very insightful paper by uh, a young fellow uh, who works for CNRS uh, uh, in Argentina, now moved to Montreal. He's located at Uranos in, in Montreal, Alexi Hennard. Uh, and uh, he showed that another number that is, that is very relevant to this is the probability of sufficient causation. So uh, one question would be whether or not greenhouse gas emissions are necessary for an event to occur. Another question might be whether or not greenhouse gas emissions are sufficient for the event to occur. If they're sufficient for the event to occur, then uh, they, the event would occur virtually all of the time because we have elevated greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so in that case, uh, we would expect to see a probability of sufficient causation very near one. But what we actually see are probabilities of necessary causation uh, for many events that are close to one, but nevertheless probabilities of sufficient causation that are, that are small. Uh, so we're not yet in a state where uh, the kinds of extreme events that we're observing uh, our, our regular occurrences in, in our climate system, although we're getting to a state where that might, be, might become the case soon. So these are again media pictures. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the Fort McMurray fire now. Um, and this is another photo of the evacuation of, of Fort McMurray. Uh, this is another kind of evacuation that took place at the same time. So you, so you, you see some, uh, some living avian creatures that are, that are trying to, to escape the fire. Uh, this is what the consequence of the, for, for humans who were, many humans who were evacuated was this, this, uh, uh, a shelter in, in Winnipeg, in, uh, in Edmonton that was, that was set up to house many of the people who were evacuated. And for people who lived in the uh, a wildland urban interface, uh, this is a consequence that many people in, in Fort McMurray experienced. Uh, on May the first ignition, a major spread a few days later, 88,000 people displaced, two, two fatalities, uh, 2,400 homes destroyed, uh, 665 uh, work camp units destroyed in, in oil sands operations, uh, well, 3.6 billion dollars in insured losses, but now total losses have recently been estimated to be close to 10, not 10 billion dollars. So that's a huge hit for for uh, a comp an economy the size of Canada's. Okay, um, we we didn't study the event per se. We studied the risk factors that that surround the event, and so uh, we'd be studying fire weather indicators and, and how those fire weather indicators were different in an area that included Fort McMurray on, in today's climate as opposed to uh, a previous climate. And so you need observations and model output. And the uh, observations that we use come primarily from uh, uh, something called the Global Fire Weather Database, uh, which is based on the MERA reanalysis products, so high resolution. Uh, modern reanalysis of the, of the climate system. Uh, we didn't use precipitation from uh, the reanalysis. So reanalysis is an estimate of uh, what a temperature field, a wind field, a precipitation field, wind, uh, uh, vertical pressure field, and so on, would look like uh, it is constrained by observations and the constraint is imposed through a weather forecasting system. Basically, you ingest uh, today's observations. You forecast ahead a very short period of time so that you end up with a spatially infilled version of those observations, and you record that. And for some aspects of reanalysis, we would consider that as being very close to the truth, circulation related, for example, very well constrained by observations. Temperature is quite well constrained by observations. Uh, the first reanalysis that was published in 1996 from the National Center 
for environmental prediction in the United States. There's a very nice supporting paper for that. And it classifies all of the variables that come out of these forecast models according to type as to whether or not they're strongly constrained by observations or poorly constrained by observations. The precipitation is one of these things that is, is very poorly constrained by observations. So with one exception, there are no reanalyses yet that, that use precipitation data as a constraint. Uh, the one exception is the North American regional reanalysis, and the way in which they imposed the constraint was not um, precipitation amount per se, but by taking into account the latent heat that is released when precipitation is formed. That affects the, the, the uh, energy balance in, in the vertical. Uh, so precipitation is basically a model output, even in, in a reanalysis, even if other aspects of the reanalysis are constrained. And so instead we used uh, uh, a precipitation, newly published precipitation product uh, that uses multiple observational sources to provide a, a gridded, high resolution gridded product that is, we think is a pretty high quality. Uh, for the, the model, we use the CAN ESM, uh, so ESM stands for Earth System Model, so it's atmosphere, ocean, land surface, carbon cycle, uh, all coupled together uh, at a global scale. Uh, it's operated by the Canadian Centre for Climate Modeling and Analysis, which is located in Victoria, it's part of Environment Canada. Um, they have recently produced a very large ensemble of climate change simulations uh, of uh, historical climate change and future climate change uh, under uh, all forcings combined with RCP 8.5 conditions going into the future an ensemble of 50 simulations. So uh, these models simulate weather and, and you know, starting from slightly perturbed uh, initial conditions, you simulate different sequence of, of weather events in, in one of these models. And so a short-term 50-year, 20-year, 30-year trend that would be computed might be quite different from one realization to the next. Just, just as we have weather affecting uh, the evolution of the observed <coughs> And we have a difficult time, actually, it's kind of separating the force component in the observations from the, from the internal variability component in the, in the observations. So recently, the climate modeling community has begin, begun to understand that these very large ensembles might be useful for understanding internal variability. And so uh, with this particular model, we have ensembles of size 50, <coughs> taking human and natural forcing into account and taking natural forcing only into account. And so those are the basic uh, data resources that we, we use. Uh, in order to ask questions about fire weather indices, you need to downscale to uh, relatively fine resolution. So you can see here what the, the resolution is of the CAN ESM model. It's uh, about 2.8 degree by 2.8 degree grid boxes on the ground. These are large, 300 kilometers on, on a side uh, at mid-latitudes, so that's large. Uh, uh, what you're seeing here that is the topography of the land surface as it's represented in this particular model. And this is compared with a digital elevation model, high resolution digital elevation model on the left. And so this is only a vague representation of, of that. Uh, MIRA is substantially higher resolution uh, and does a better job of resolving the topography. Uh, and so we use MIRA as a statistical downscaling target. So downscaling the output from CAN ESM to, to mirror resolutions. Um, before you do the event attribution study, it's useful to study uh, underlying climate change, to, uh, to, to know whether or not something in the climate system that's related to uh, the thing that you're studying has changed in a systematic way over time, whether or not that's the case. And so uh, what you're looking at here is uh, so the extended warm season. This is May through su to September temperature for, uh, if I go backwards, or basically this part of Western Canada, a large chunk that includes Alberta uh, and, and Saskatchewan. And uh, so we have observations in here uh, with some 
gradual increasing trend. Uh, the observation is warm about a degree over uh, this period, 1960 to 2016 or so. Uh, we have force simulations here in blue that take anthropogenic and natural forcing uh, into account. And what you see is that this model warms a little bit too quickly uh, as time goes along, but that the variability is pretty close to uh, the variability that is observed on this scale. And these are naturally forced simulations, only not including the greenhouse gas forcing. And, and so you see that there isn't really a systematic trend here. But you can identify individual events, as you can in the observations as well. So see this dip here in 1992. That's Mount Pinatubo. Okay, it's the effect of Mount Pinatubo in the observations uh, here and in, in the climate models here. Uh, and so climate models actually do that pretty well, these large volcanic eruptions that occur. Uh, if you conduct a formal detection and attribution study, which asks whether or not you detect this kind of signal in these observations, then the answer is that yes, you do. But you have to scale the, the model simulated signal down substantially in order to obtain a best fit. Um, this, this is a known problem with this particular model that responds a little bit too vigorously to, to greenhouse gas forcing. Uh, we don't have any concerns here that we're not detecting human-induced climate change on this scale. Uh, we, we are. Uh, and so then you can go ahead and, and attribute uh, a, a, a temperature trend, the magnitude of a temperature trend to to observe forcing, and, and that turns to be about a degree um, over a 30-year, 35-year period. Okay, now for the event attribution uh, de definition, uh, can't study the fire per se. We don't have a fire model coupled to to uh, uh, coupled to this Earth system model. Um, so rather, we base uh, the study on the level of, of fire weather indices. And uh, the area that we consider is this uh, area here, which is uh, uh, identified by Béranger and, and, and colleagues as, as a homogeneous uh, fire regime region. Pretty large patch of territory, but it, it runs through the, through the boreal. There's Fort McMurray there. Uh, so it's it's fire weather indices averaged over this region that, that we study. Um, so you all be very familiar with this, and uh, you'll know much more about this than I do, but uh, here's a description of the Canadian fire weather index system. Uh, so there are several fuel and moisture codes. Uh, they are driven by things like temperature, relative humidity, wind, and rain. So the fine fuel moisture code uh, are organized kind of by the depth of the uh, fuel layer laying on the land surface is taken into account. So this is a this is the uh, very thin layer. This is a thicker layer. This includes the land surface, the drought code, uh, driven by temperature and rain. Uh, so we calculate all of these things from the downscale output that, that we obtained. Uh, using wind and uh, temperature relative humidity and uh, rain at, or and the, the fine fuel moisture code, uh, you can calculate the initial spread index. Uh, so we also studied that. You can calculate the buildup index based on the duff moisture code and, and the drug code. And you can calculate a fire weather index that, that integrates all of these things. So uh, Megan, Kirschmeyer and Young, who did this work, uh, learned how to calculate these things and, uh, and, and computed them all for all of this model. Uh, okay, so here are um, some distributions that, that come out of this and, and that uh, give you some idea of, uh, for example, what the distribution of, fire, of the fire weather index looks like. Uh, what level is considered to be extreme. So this is a, a number that is identified by NRCAN, Natural Resources Canada, as being an extreme level of the fire weather index. It's the same number that is used everywhere in Canada. It's not specific to this particular area. Uh, 
And this is what this distribution looks like if you condition on fire days. So the distribution has substantially different shape and it's pushed to the right, uh, uh, conditional on knowing that a fire occurred. So there's a relationship between this number and, and the risk of fire. Uh, similar for the fine fuel moisture code. Uh, so this dashed line is the value that was observed at the station near Port McMurray at the time of the, of the fire. Uh, so it's a similar figure for the fine field moisture coat, similar figure for the drought coat, uh, the duff moisture coat, which was not quite at uh, NRCAN specified extreme levels, but uh, the observed level is right in the middle of this distribution that, uh, that you obtain for, for fire days, and uh, the initial spread index, which was substantially higher than the uh, and it can specify extreme level. Uh, we also study the length of the fire season. Um, and, uh, and so you need a definition of the length of the fire season. And so we define that as a start being three days after uh, being at the time when uh, there had been three consecutive snow free days and the end of the fire season being the return of the snow cover. So this was a spring fire and uh, the, the spring uh, human-induced, human ignition fires uh, have a high risk of occurrence in, in this part of the world, uh, particularly during the time between snow off and green up of the, of the aspen understory. So as soon as the aspen understory greens up, then uh, the forest is less flammable and, and the probability of a, of a human ignition fire de decreases. But there's this period of time uh, early in the year when there's lots of dry material on the forest floor. And the crowns are desiccated because they've been exposed to winter flow uh, atmosphere all winter long without the, the trees transpiring very much. And so uh, that's a, a time of elevated risk for human induced fires. Um, so here are um, estimates of the, uh, this, the climatological fire season start date. Uh, in this part of the world, it would be somewhere around uh, late April, early May. Uh, a climatological season fire end and at length. And so one of the questions was, was whether or not the risk of a, of a longer fire season have been elevated as a consequence of human influence on the climate system. So for event def definitions, we uh, used uh, uh, basically the NRCAN definitions of extreme values of fire weather indices. Uh, and then the thing that we referenced against those fire weather indices is the 90th percentile of the daily value of those fire weather indices for given fire seasons. And so we asked how that distribution had changed over, over time. Uh, and so here are some results. This H, what we call HFR9 is the, uh, is the, is the region that contains Fort McMurray. And so uh, these are what these distributions look like uh, when we analyze the output from all of these, from this, this large ensemble taking all forcings into account and natural forcings only into account. Uh, so these are the distributions of the 90th percentile. So uh, there are 50 values of the 90th percentile uh, that are available. We're using uh, a kernel-based estimator to, to come up with probability distributions. Uh, the blue indicates all forcings, and you see that for the fire weather index, uh, the all forcings distribution has shifted substantially to uh, the right, and that there's quite a bit more area in uh, the tail that is now considered to be extreme compared to a natural forcing zone. And so you might think that the probability of necessary causation, this fraction of attributable risk, would be large in this case. Okay. Uh, somewhat the same for the fine fuel moisture code, uh, the duff moisture code, and, and the drought code. So as you go to longer time scales, then this distribution shifts less, basically, is, is what you're seeing. Um, 
So these are the corresponding, so that's, that's the, what happened to these indices. Uh, so these are the driving things for these indices, and it's interesting to look at them. So a big signal in temperature, uh, with a large shift to the right, uh, virtually no signal in relative humidity, and that's something that we, we basically expect. So we expect that as the atmosphere warms, the specific humidity, the amount of moisture in the atmosphere to increase. But the fraction of moisture that the atmosphere holds relative to its moisture holding capacity, we expect that to stay roughly constant as, as time goes on. Uh, change, what uh, surprised to us was a change in the wind speed distribution as it's simulated by these models, very clear signal, uh, to windier conditions. Uh, and virtually no signal in, in precipitation over the as at this time of year over the, over the period that we're considering. Uh, which again is maybe not too big a surprise. The signal in, in precipitation is large. So warmer uh, and windier is, is what the models are, are suggesting. And so that leads to this. Uh, it's driven primarily by changes in temperature and wind speed. And uh, again, these, these vertical lines tell you about the so-called extreme levels in the Canadian wildlife fire information system. Okay, so how do we turn this into event attribution numbers? Um, so here are these probabilities, uh, P1 on the left. There are four colors corresponding to these four indices. Uh, the, the higher one is the current probability. The lower one is the uh, probability in the undisturbed climate. They're obtained by integrating these areas under these probability distributions uh, to, the, to the right of these levels that are considered to be extreme. And so then you can calculate the fractions of attributable risk uh, for the fire weather index. About 85% of the probability of exceedance above this extreme level could be attributed to human influence on the climate system in this large region. Uh, with declining numbers for the fine fuel code, the drought, duff moisture code, and the drought code. Uh, you can also ask questions about the probability of sufficient causation. You see that uh, for the uh, fire weather index, uh, probability of necessary causation is high. Uh, so to be in this part of the distribution uh, is very helpful if you have additional greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is what that's telling you. Uh, but that's still not sufficient to be in that part of the distribution regularly. So it's telling you that this thing hasn't shifted along far enough so that most of the distribution is to the left of the, the extreme line. Uh, even for the, 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 the drug code for a, a number that's kind of in the center where the extreme level is in the, in the center of these two distributions, you, you don't end up with enormously large probabilities of sufficient causation. And then a number that's easy to understand is the risk ratio. So just comparing the probability of the current climate with the probability of the undisturbed climate. And so the risk ratio for the fire weather index, an indicator of the risk of, of uh, a large fire in this region in the present climate is about six times higher than, than in the the previous comment. Uh, so Megan also studied uh, fire season, so spread day distributions, and uh, and so you you see some indication that uh, probability of spread is of an elevated number of spread days is a little bit greater in the current climate than it was in the, in the previous climate, and with corresponding risk ratios being factor of a, of a few larger. Uh, she considered the start and end, the date and the fire season length, and again you see the same kind of same kind of result, uh, somewhat higher uh, probabilities of uh, an earlier start date, uh, uh, a later uh, later season end date, and a longer season in the in the current climate. And so 
Uh, the conclusions that you would draw, our goal was uh, to quantify the contribution of anthropogenic forcing to extreme fire risk in, in this southern prairie zone. Um, and we looked at lots of different metrics, and uh, the conclusion that you would draw is that the Fort McMurray fire uh, occurred in a world with uh, earlier and longer fire seasons made more likely uh, increased risk of extreme fire potential uh, with high, higher increased risk of high fire weather indices, more days with significant spread potential. So all of the, all of the uh, components of the recipe are there in essence to, that, that indicate that this happened in a context where humans had an influence on, on uh, the likelihood and the spread of the, of the fire. Okay, um, if I have, I don't know how much more time I have, maybe I should end at this point, or um, I could very briefly say a few things about uh, other events. So this is the Calgary, this is what, a, a view of uh, what the East, uh, East, East Village area of Calgary looked like uh, in uh, June of 2013. And uh, so here's a, there's a huge amount of loss, and, and you can see immediately why that loss occurred. There are no overhead wires, and so all of the communications and all of the electrical distribution is below ground. And guess where water goes when, when water is laying on the surface? Of course, it goes into all of those cavities uh, and, uh, and makes those systems inoperative. And so I was involved in a group that did an event attribution study on, on this. Um, we used a regional climate model, and uh, a few and the question that we asked was about increased precipitation, increased risk of heavy precipitation in, in this particular area. Uh, so using Canadian analysis system, this is the observed uh, average precipitation, uh, spatially average precipitation at about the time of the event over this part of, of Canada, southern Alberta. Uh, the model that we used simulates that particular event at these levels. So it's wetter than observed. Uh, the analysis system probably underestimates the amount of precipitation. Uh, it may well be that the model overestimates the amount of precipitation. Uh, we use that model in an event attribution mode, in this mode where you specify sea surface temperature uh, anomalies uh, for the present climate. And then uh, we did it again using three different climate models to reconstruct the sea surface temperature anomalies for previous climate. So you see there's a little bit of uncertainty um, in, in these probability distributions, but not a huge amount that comes about as a consequence of specifying uh, different sea surface temperature anomalies. And you see that these distributions are, are different and uh, that the frequency of the event as it was simulated by the climate model uh, roughly double from a 1 in 25 year event to a, a 1 in 12 year event or so. And that the magnitude uh, also increases a little bit uh, by about 10%. And so you calculate a fraction of the attributable risk of about 50%. What has the current probability of that kind of an event on that scale would be attributed to human influence on the climate system. That's a really complicated question. You should go down to smaller scales and and it becomes almost impossible to, to say anything. And the scale that they, you know, people would really like us to talk about is the Bow River Valley uh, that, that drains through, through Calgary. That's where all the, the water came from. And at that very small scale, the Bow River Valley is pretty small, it then becomes hard to say very much about uh, what the probability of the, of the occurrence of this event is. The signal to noise ratio just doesn't allow you to do it. But also, you're not fully representing all of the relevant processes. So the, the, the event occurred uh, at a time when the Bow River Basin still contained a lot of snow. The ground was still frozen. And there was a substantial amount of precipitation that was rained on top of that snow. So you have a rain on snow event, produces a lot of runoff. Uh, very little runoff can be absorbed into the land surface because the land surface is frozen. And so there really is no place for the water to go except downstream and into the basements of Calgary. And, and, that's, and that's what happened. Uh, it's not historically, it's not a historic extreme event. 
Um, it's a rare event, but it's, um, as indicated here, our, our suggestion was one in, well, roughly one in 10, one in 25 years, something like that. Uh, if you compare that against the streamflow record, it's also not, a, not the historic streamflow event for, for that area. Uh, China had a very hot summer in, in 2003, uh, 13. Uh, with uh, large economic impacts and who knows how many deaths. The Chinese don't report that. Uh, so this is kind of like the European 2003 heat wave. Um, and uh, using an event attribution study, we estimated that a temperature anomaly in China of this magnitude uh, would have been a one in 270 year event in a, in a pre-industrial climate and that it's now something like a one in four year event in, in China. And so that produces a very large fraction of attributable risk, uh, almost 98%. And that's the level of fraction of attributable risk that is now kind of routinely found when we're defining events in terms of seasonal mean temperature over a large subcontinental area. So this is not a surprising result. Uh, even so, the probability of sufficient causation is still not that large. It's telling us it's about a one in, one in four year event. If it becomes an every year event, then this number would, become, would come to be very close to one. Okay. And then um, another event that uh, drew the attention of many people, and many people in Canada, was the record low Arctic sea ice cover that uh, was seen in 2012. Um, so this is a photo I took myself, by the way. It's a taken that alert at the very northern tip of of Ellesmere Island. Um, uh, this shows, uh, uh, so these, these are annual evolutions of Arctic sea ice extent. Uh, this is the climatological uh, evolution uh, varying from something like 13,000 square kilometers uh, in uh, May through to a climatological minimum of around seven. Uh, square kilometers in, in September. The minimum always occurs in, in September. Um, that's the 1981 to 2010 climatological average with, uh, with this, uh, two standard deviations plotted either side of it. Uh, 2016 is here. Um, and I'm not quite sure where we are today. Uh, we'll be up here somewhere. But 2016 was very close to uh, 2000, 2015 as there. Uh, 2007 is not on here, but 2007 was a very extreme event. This is 2012. Um, so a very low uh, sea ice extent in September, about 4 million square kilometers. And, uh, this is a number that's been declining steadily over time. And so we, we undertook one of these event attribution studies, again using uh, large ensembles, this time using uh, actually three climate models, uh, using a climate model that under-simulates Arctic sea ice extent, another model that gets it about right climatologically, and a third model that slightly overestimates Arctic sea ice extent. And in all cases, you come to the conclusion that the 2012 event probably would have been impossible in the absence of human influence on the climate system. It might be the first event in the study where that's the case. So the uh, same post up did, did that work. Uh, I'm just about done. So we we have a, a, you know, lots of unresolved issues in this area of science that need to be taken into account. Uh, so uh, we're still having this this active debate about how to characterize events. So do we analyze a class of event or or an individual event? Do we use a risk-based approach versus a storyline-based approach? Um, the, the, risk-based versus storyline-based, or individual, is not completely synonymous with, with storyline-based approaches. Another paper by Alexi, the same Alexi Hanna, uh, that makes that point, and, and he illustrates in a very technical paper how this could be done using a data simulation system of the kind that is, is coupled to weather forecasting systems uh, to study specific events, uh, and yet be able to say something about changes in probability of occurrence, but, but very highly conditioned. Uh, so we need to worry about the event definition. We're very, as you'll have seen, we're very dependent on models 
there's no historical data that we can rely upon, so we need to evaluate the model uh, using related data, using a detection and long-term detection and attribution study, for example. But then when it comes to actually estimating these risks, we're, this is a number, you know, basically a model-based number. And so we need to rely on our, the confidence that we have in the model and our understanding of the physics in order to make an interpretation of these statistical results that we're getting using climate models. Um, we have to worry about the counterfactual state specification uncertainty, at least a little bit when we're using the, the conditional approach. We have a big selection bias problem. Um, the events that we're studying at the moment are still the events that are being brought to us either by policymakers or the media. The media rush up and they ask the question, and so that's the question that we, we try to answer when we try to develop a, a scientific question that's related to that. Uh, but it's a little bit like somebody rushing up, you know, big dog biting you, and, and then uh, somebody rushes up and says, well, how big was that big dog that bit you? Um, you know, it's a bit circular. I mean, you already know it was a big dog that bit you. Uh, and, and now we're just being asked to quantify that a little bit. Um, if we had uh, objective event selection criteria that we could run operationally uh, coupled to a weather forecasting system, whether or not there was an impact or not, then we'd be able to, then we'd have many events to study. Uh, for each of these events, we'd be estimating the probability of occurrence in the current climate. Uh, if we did that for a decade, uh, then, then from observations, we would obtain, uh, gradually obtain estimates of the current probability of occurrence in those events, directly from observations, and we could compare that systematically with our estimates of those probabilities and, and determine whether or not we're actually estimating those probabilities well. And so that's something that, that we're not yet able to do, and operationalization in some sense would, would help us to do that. Another thing that uh, we, of course, need to worry about is, is communications. So um, the time at which, as scientists, we run into trouble is, is immediately in the wake of the event when, when somebody with a microphone rushes up to you and asks you to, to, to say something. And that's a time at which you can say very little. And so we need to find a way of um, controlling the media agenda a little bit. And if we had an operational system that was able to give a first considered um, opinion within, say, two weeks of uh, the occurrence of an event. And then you could say to the media, well, I can't tell you today, but uh, we'll be releasing a, a statement on this in two weeks' time. And it actually would provide a, a second occasion on which to communicate some information about the event, because then the release of, of that information becomes a story in itself, uh, as opposed to racing to try to stay within the, the media cycle that's, that's immediate to the event that just occurred. And so uh, that's the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for, uh, for your attention and for, uh, for persisting with uh, an anglophone for this period of time. So, um, Did you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is how uh, would an operational system work? Um, I, I can imagine it working in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, and so, uh, one, one thing that meteorological services already do in Canada, in the UK, and many other places is to issue seasonal forecasts on a regular basis. So in Canada, we have an ensemble forecasting system that updates our seasonal forecasts uh, on a monthly basis. So every month, you can, you can, you can get a new long-term forecast uh, based on an ensemble of simulations. Uh, and that ensemble of simulations takes current sea surface temperature conditions. It's initialized from current sea surface temperature conditions, and it takes the current composition of the atmosphere into account. And it uses essentially the same model that uh, 
that we use to, uh, that, to produce these large ensembles. So if you could run in parallel with that, the second forecast, operation forecast stream that is identical except it doesn't take human-induced forcing on the climate system into account, then you would have in real time, essentially, uh, with at a one-month update cycle, ensembles of simulations available that could be uh, used to assess what is the current risk of, of events. So you could define the events uh, in terms of uh, the historical performance of this forecasting system, for example. So you could, you could pick a threshold of 95th percentile of surface temperature on some scale uh, and, and ask, well, what is the probability of exceedance of that particular uh, threshold this particular season? Uh, and, and how does that differ between? You just do that repeatedly. So about half, half of what you would require uh, for many of these questions is, is already more or less in place. So the, the UK has been running a project called Euclea at the Met, at the Met Office, um, and, and they have, they're in a very similar state. So they're, they're now running very large ensembles of their climate model on a regular basis uh, for the factual part of the world. Um, Basically, in parallel with their seasonal forecasting system, they're not yet using their seasonal forecasting system, but they're they're maintaining uh, basically a large ensembles as time goes along, so that they can ask these these questions in a, in a more or less operation. Yeah. Excuse me, I don't know where there have been any previous extreme event like this in Portland. I don't know very much about the fire history in, of the region, but there is, uh, there is another large fire that, that, was, that was documented um, prior to World War II or around World War II, I, I believe. This, yeah. Sure. Well, <coughs> the Chinchaga River burning? That's, yeah. That's, yeah. I think that data is very difficult to use because, of course, we manage the forest very differently today than, yeah. than, than we do in the, in the and, you know, data. We probably haven't done, uh, you know, the best job possible in terms of, of uh, recording fire size and fire incidents and cause of ignition and so on all the time. But it would be a very inhomogeneous data set, and that would make it difficult to use from a climate perspective. Um, I did with a postdoc a long time ago ask um, a related question, is there evidence um, in Western Canada of human influence on the area burnt over time? And um, the data that we used uh, was the area, seasonal area burnt uh, in very large fires. If we restrict ourselves to very large fires, then uh, maybe these are less affected by changes in, in human sources of or human management of the forest system or, or human human sources of ignition. At least that's what we'd like to, to think at the time. So we did detect, this was a, a paper a long time ago in JRL, we did detect human influence on, on this particular metric of fire behavior. Is um, the question is essentially if uh, we took uh, results of an event attribution study to court, would, would the court find that sufficient to to um, find the emitters of greenhouse gas emissions, for example, liable for some fraction of the damages? Um, 
I don't, we haven't had a, I think an example in the courts where the courts have determined whether or not the available evidence is, is sufficient. Uh, when you hear lawyers talk about this, um, they would say that uh, the, the responsibility to exercise due diligence, to exercise care, now lies with the, the forest manager or, or with the emitter. That uh, the lack of information is 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 not an excuse for for not acting, and that uh, the the measure that would be used would be whether a reasonable person would would take a, a, an action in the, in the context of the information that's available. Um, and I think they would argue, the environmental lawyers in Canada would argue that, that there is so much information available in climate change that you would, that you would have a responsibility to take climate change into account in the design of a new building, for example, or um, in how you, how you further manage the forest from from this point onwards, or how you set uh, uh, building codes for, or land manage how you establish land management practices for homes that find, find themselves in the, in the, in the forest urban interface. But I, I'm not aware that this has been tested yet. But, uh, I think climate scientists would think that the, would, you know, depending on the question, maybe maybe not in the case of the Fort McMurray fires, but it was directly a temperature-based question. I think. I think we would argue that the evidence is now sufficiently strong to sustain a legal argument. Is, are there statistical models that... that um, no, so at the, at the moment, we're using primarily a Monte Carlo approach. Um, so we're doing... Uh, we're using climate models, uh, so these are physical models, uh, and, and we're incorporating these, uh, these physical models within a Monte Carlo modeling Monte Carlo simulation framework, uh, basically by choosing random initial conditions for the physical models. And so we're, we're sampling from some set of plausible initial states, and we can only do that a small number of times uh, if we're using a full planet system model because these models are, are very expensive. So 50 would be a large number of, of simulations. And then we're integrating those climate models forward from those randomly simulated selected initial states. Uh, and what that's doing is, um, if you think of an ergodic process, it's simply picking another possible path through the distribution of paths that are possible for the ergodic process to take. Each of those paths is governed by the same physical laws. So that's, so that's the extent to which there is really physical, statistical reasoning that, that underlies the estimation of these probabilities. I have a quick question. Um, you said that the, the, the selection of the extreme events is not complicated. And I'm curious about what, what would you use as the objective criterion to select? Right, so the, the, the way in which um, the events to be studied at the moment is selected is um, an event that we recognize to be large occurs, and then we pay particular attention to it if there are large impacts. So we could think of the Louisiana floods, uh, of Hurricane Katrina, uh, the Calgary floods, like that kind of thing. Um, a, a much more mundane approach to this would be, uh, if we're considering a heat event, for example, uh, to estimate what is the standard deviation of uh, 
of summer mean temperature at a particular location or in a particular region, and then to define a high threshold, uh, which might be you know, two and a half or three standard deviations above the mean. And so that, that sets, a, sets a fixed threshold, and you can set that fixed threshold everywhere. And so then you could use the tools that you have available to estimate well, what is the probability of exceedance of that threshold, irrespective of, of whether or not someone is paying attention to it in the media. What is the probability of exceedance of that threshold in the current climate? What would the probability of exceedance of that threshold have been in a previous climate? That, that, would, that would be one, a very mundane way of, of operating. And of, of course, there are other kinds of events where uh, it would be a little bit harder to define, uh, to, to come up with an objective event definition. And, and one would be drought. So if you think about drought, it's a, you know, it's a phenomenon that has some spatial scale and some temporal scale. And when a drought occurs, people are impacted. But a drought is occurring all the time. And so then, you know, what defines an extreme drought? And how do you define an extreme drought objectively? Was it agricultural, hydrological, some other kind of drought definition? Uh, how do you define it objectively? And how do you find an, an event definition uh, so that the event occurs frequently enough so that you can, over a period of time, estimate from observations what its probability of occurrence is? So, what we're seeing in this from Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Francis.